We're happy to have Dan Barry speaking today about his book, Breslin, Essential Writings, Columns and Other Journalism, 1960 to 2004. Not just a compilation, it's profusely annotated, um, a collection of 73 columns and two book length works. Uh, and of course, it's a handsome book. Um, Dan is a New York Times reporter and columnist, an author, and a multiple award winner who has shared a George Polk Award and a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, that makes him a good match for his larger than life subject, who won a Polk and a Pulitzer, and whose occupation is listed in Wikipedia as reporter, columnist, novelist, screenwriter, playwright, and actor. And that doesn't even co cover all of his uh, occupations. <laughs> um, Breslin worked as an investigative reporter or columnist or just plain storyteller for numerous papers, including the New York Herald, Tribune, the Daily News, the New York Journal, and Newsday. And what I've got here is a rare uh, batch that Newsday crafted um, saying, Breslin switched, how about you? Uh, Dan came to compile this book, his sixth, when a book editor suggested to the Library of America that Breslin was worth a volume and that Dan should be the, per the one to um, edit the volume. He agreed to do it for all of $3,000, which, which I think was a public thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, and that shows his love for Jimmy Breslin to do this kind of work uh, for a pittance. Um, with some help, Dan tracked down and read most uh, and read most, if not all, of his columns and recommended which books, which of his books to include. He will talk about why why Breslin matters. He told me and uh, why he was worthy of such a volume. He will share anecdotes from his long friendship with Breslin and hopefully tell some colorful stories. I'll do my best. Okay, so first of all, I apologize. I'm not Maggie Haberman. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Nothing I could do about it. Um, also, I know that you, uh, many of you knew Breslin, and that means you either loved him or hated him or somewhere in the middle. Uh, sorry. Um, so anyway, um, I was going through some voicemails um, that I had, uh, because that's what I do late at night. I go through my old voicemails, and uh, <laughs> it's a sad life. And, um, and so I found one, <clears throat> and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read um, what uh, the caller said. Um, I'll have to edit some of the language. <clears throat> I'm not going to do the imitation. You know, everyone does that, Breslin, but I... Jimmy Breslin, 212-247-7963. I'm going to sleep. I'll just give you the scenario here. My wife, she had to go out to lunch, and she said that Dan Barry was disappointed that he didn't win the Pulitzer Prize. Now, she's meeting this guy who's in the business, so I know it's right. I guess it could have been Clora she had to see. At any rate, she said that he was disappointed in the result of the Pulitzer. F that thing. <laughs> that thing has outlived itself now. It's not there anymore. I saw that some of them thing there, they point out to me that the whole staff of the newspaper was part of the thing that got the prize, including somebody from the Times, one with the staff helping or something. That's not the idea of the thing. <laughs> so F them. Don't. I don't want to hear that. That's bullshit. It's not that important anymore. It was once... Now it ain't worth grieving over. Goodbye. You're doing terrific work. What do you care? <laughs> Thank you. Um, April 2010. Uh, so I'm sharing this with you not because uh, I get out, I get any joy out of pointing out that I'm a two-time loser. 
uh, on Pulitzer Day, the winners all go out and celebrate. Um, the nominated Pulitzer finalists go to the Wakamba Lounge and drink in silence. <laughs> I've been there too much. Um, so, uh, why, did I, why did I share that with you besides uh, its embarrassment? Um, because I think it reveals three things about Breslin, three elements about Breslin. First, there's the anger. He's angry. Anger was his oxygen, right? Second, there's the flash of arrogance, right? Uh, uh, the Pulitzer is not that important anymore, he says. It was once, and now it ain't worth grieving over. In other words, it was important when he won it <laughs> back in 1986, but now it's not worth anything. Um, and lastly, and I think most importantly, there's his empathy, okay? Uh, he didn't have to call, but he did. And there are many, many stories of Breslin visiting people in hospitals, uh, calling up if, after someone had lost someone, uh, over and over again. And this is in part because, as you all know, he knew grief, okay? He knew loss. And I think that that animated a lot of his writing, along with anger and, uh, let's say, a, a large dollop of arrogance. Um, so... Each part of this is very complicated, um, but uh, I think I'm going to try to explain why, I, why he was worth this, why he was worth, you know, $3,000 to me. No. Um, <laughs> it took like three years. Um, and, and I don't think there's anyone else, um, any, any newspaper daily journalist who is included in the Library of Amer America canon. You know, there's Joan Didion, there's, there's uh, A.J. Liebling, more of a critic, there's Damon Runyon, more of a short story writer. But Breslin is being celebrated here for what he was doing for a newspaper mostly, and mostly on deadline, which I think raises how extraordinary this stuff is sometimes. So I'm gonna give you just one example. Okay, so we all know the Gravedigger story, right? Um, Let's put it in some context. So it's November 1963. He's, he's been at the Herald Tribune, I don't think a year. Um, thank you. So he's been there about a year. And um, so um, Kennedy is uh, uh, shot, and Breslin joins hundreds of other journalists to descend upon Dallas. Okay, so what is the first thing he does? He goes and tracks down the emergency room doctor, a guy named Malcolm Perry, who was sitting in the cafeteria reserved for doctors, and he was eating salmon croquettes. And then there's a, a call over the um, intercom, and they're looking for an emergency room doctor, and he's the guy. And so imagine that. So first of all, Breslin recognizes that human moment, tracks the guy down, and then you know, basically um, deposes him about what that was like. And so Perry comes out, and they're on an aluminum cart, is the President of the United States, okay? And in the corner is a dark-haired woman um, with blood on her dress. And so now Perry is trying to save this person's life, the President of the United States, and Breslin puts you in that damn room. It's pretty extraordinary. He puts, it in, he puts you in the room. He even puts you in the room when um, the doctors look up at one, uh, each other and they go, this, we can't do it, nothing, he's, he's done. He puts you in the room when the, the priest, Oscar Huber, comes in. And he has this lovely paragraph. Um, he could go loud and he could go quiet. So the president is dead. And now everyone has to leave um, the president to his wife and to the priest. Everything that was inside that room now belonged to Jacqueline Kennedy and Father Oscar Huber and the things in which they believe. It's a beautiful line. So if I had written that, I would retire. I'm done. <laughs> so then he does the famous gravedigger story, maybe a couple of days later, right? And you probably know this. He was, he was talking to Art Buckwald, and he's trying to figure out how to not to go with the crowd. The crowd's going to all the pageantry. Breslin's instinct is to go somewhere else, which, as you also all know, comes from his sports writing expertise, or his background, rather, his experience as a sports writer. So he's, you know, basically 
chatting with Buckwald. And he says, I'm thinking about going to Arlington and finding the guy who digs the grave. Buckwald says, yeah, that's a pretty good idea for a story. That's all Breslin needed. He needed the validation from someone else that he respected to say, go. That's, that's smart. And so, as you know, he finds Clifton Pollard. He's a, a black man, a World War II veteran, and he is digging the president's grave, <clears throat> and he's earning $3.01 an hour. And it's a privilege. It's an honor, he says. It's an honor. Okay, now if I had written those two stories in a week, I would have retired, I would have taken up interpretive dance, I don't know, I was <laughs> spelunking, I would have done spelunking, or mountain climbing, rock climbing, uh, but no. So he comes back, and you have to remember, um, it's late November, so that means Thanksgiving is here. And so what does Breslin do? Um, he goes to the automat. He goes to the automat on Thanksgiving Day, it was at 8th and 33rd. And he sits with the single men, the lonely men, who don't have anywhere else to go for Thanksgiving. I'm just trying to think of like what that must have been like. You come back from Kennedy's funeral, and you go to the automat on Thanksgiving. There's a dark Irish thing going on there, I think. <laughs> And so this is how he ends that. It's a very quick column, actually, written on deadline. A lot of other people sat alone. Only one or two tables were empty. They came in and took trays and waited silently on line at the cafeteria steam tables for their food. There were very few coin slots left in the automat these days. There were two banks of, of, uh, there were two banks of coin slots with their little windows for sandwiches, one for pies, another for cakes, and one for bread, bread and rolls. There was only one bank for the baked macaroni and cheese, three nickels, and beef pie, one quarter, three nickels, and other automat specialties. Coffee still comes out of a spout with a silver handle. It costs 10 cents and still is good coffee. Outside, 8th Avenue is vacant. A few cabs moved by, now and then a bus. The few people on the street were old and alone. There were some post office workers. They were paid yesterday, and they scouted around 8th Avenue for some place open so they could cash the check. Otherwise, it was a vacant day in the automat, which was right. Yesterday was a day meant to be vacant. It seemed right to sit on Thanksgiving Day and put out butts in a coffee cup, and every once in a while, have an attendant in white shirt and slacks reach past your shoulder and take crumpled napkins from the table. So what does he do? He's basically talking about an entire nation, if not a world, grieving. They're in mourning, and he goes to the automat, and he never once mentions Kennedy. Right? So a little about Breslin. You probably know a lot. Born in 1928 in Queens. His father is a, mu a musician, and uh, you know, he, he went out for the proverbial loaf of bread and never came back. And that had a profound effect on Breslin, as we know. Um, his mother, Frances, uh, worked uh, for the welfare department. She was a supervisor in East Harlem. And, um, and she, was, uh, she drank, and she was distant. And Breslin wrote once that the closest they ever came was when they sat together on the subway. Um, you know, uh, Ronnie Eldridge will tell you, you know, uh, it, he wasn't poor. It was kind of more lower middle class, OK? And, um, and he found escape from you know, the absence of a father and a distant mother through newspapers. I wonder if anyone here can identify with that, right? So, um, so he starts his own uh, neighborhood newspaper, okay? It's called The Flash. Ronnie also doesn't think this is true, but um, <laughs> supposedly um, he comes into the room and his mother has a pistol to her head. There's some wrangling. The grandmother screams. They get the, the gun away from the woman. And um, then everyone goes to bed. Just a typical Irish Catholic evening. <laughs> <laughs> but he supposedly reports it in his newspaper with the headline, Mother Tried Suicide. And then he later said that this was a bad headline. It should have been in the present tense. Mother Tries Suicide. Ronnie doesn't believe that, but anyway. So he goes to high school, he bangs around college, he, he uh, says he majored in excuses, and then he, goes to <laughs> then he goes to newspapers, okay? And so he worked at many newspapers, you know, grinding it away. Uh, he, he meets uh, uh, the former Rosemary, 
uh, Dadalico, and um, uh, that there should be a lot said about her. There should be a book just about her, because she's the one that drove him around. She's the one that took care of the six kids while he was typing either in the kitchen or sometimes in his bed. Um, she, you know, 11 o'clock, there's a fire somewhere. She's the one who would drive him. She would sit outside. But she also would sometimes interview people with him. And uh, she took care of the financial uh, 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 affairs of the family. So she really, there should be a shared byline oftentimes for Rosemary. Um, you probably know the rest. He, he's a sports writer. He's showing singular prose. He's writing about horse racing. He's writing about Casey Stengel. He catches the attention of John Hay Whitney. Whitney gives him a column. And uh, what he's writing is so fresh uh, and provocative that it becomes uh, uh, syndicated. And he becomes a kind of a national figure, this, this odd guy. And so for the next 40 years, if you think about it, he becomes like the personification of the Metro columnist. Uh, spawning generations of pale imitators, myself included. Uh, but he's also a witness to history, if you think about where he is during this time. He's there when Malcolm X gets shot, right? He's there for the, for the aftermath of the Kennedy assassination. He's there in Vietnam. Uh, he went with Walt Kelly, who used to draw Pogo. Great, great comic strip. Um, he uh, was in Northern Ireland. He was there uh, when Bobby Kennedy was shot. Uh, he, he wrote the story on deadline uh, about the assassination of John Lennon. He wrote it in less than two hours. Um, he got beaten up, I think, at the Crown Heights riots, didn't he? Um, so there really was no one quite like him uh, in his uh, writing style. And so Tom Wolfe uh, would include him among the new journalists. And, and Breslin, you know, uh, would sometimes chafe at that. You know, you do that thing where, you know, well, we're just sports writers. I learned from Jimmy Cannon. You know, what are we doing? We're doing the same thing that Charles Dickens used to do. But if, if, if Wolf had left him out, Breslin would have gone through the roof, right? <laughs> <laughs> and along, along the way, there's this persona that he develops, this good drinking beer, slob, Queens Boulevard, don't know nothing. You know, a creation, a creation. He, come by, he came by it honestly to some extent, but he's extremely well-read, extremely well-read. Dostoevsky, he, he, could, he, he, he knew that stuff. Um, and, and he would admit it. You know, maybe it was a, 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 a way of making a buck. You know, he, he saw people kind of like that. It was different from, you know, uh, 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 some of the more polished journalists of the day. Uh, this guy who looks like he was, you know, down at the end of the bar spouting witticisms. Um, uh, and he said this once. He said, there have been many Jimmy Breslins because of all the people I identified with so much turning me into them or them into me that I can't explain one Jimmy Breslin. Uh, let's talk about those three elements I mentioned. Arrogance, okay? You all know it. You probably experienced it, right? A friend of mine uh, at the New York Times used to work, uh, I think, at Newsday, and she'd get a call. She would be one of many who would get a call at around 6 in the morning. And all it would be was, I'm big. And then, boom, <laughs> hang up the phone. Right? He's kind of being funny about it, but he's kind of saying, I'm, I'm big. <laughs> right? So there's the anger. There's the anger that motivated him. He once wrote, rage is the only quality which has kept me or anybody I have ever studied writing columns for the newspapers. And as we know, sometimes that rage got the better of him. Uh, he was suspended by Newsday for a racist rant. Um, not his, his best moment. Uh, he kind of apologized and then went on Howard Stern and kind of made a joke of it. And, uh, and he had to be suspended, right? Um, but when he would channel that rage uh, into, uh, let's say, something approaching literature, it was something. And... Uh, I don't know how many here were ever on his list of people I'm not talking to this year. Uh, I wish I were so honored. Um, this is, so, so uh, I don't know if you remember Bernard Goetz. <laughs> um, so he was celebrated in the city uh, for a little while for shooting four men in the subway uh, because they had accosted him. And uh, Breslin would have none of it. 
One of the four shot by Getz, Daryl Cabey, 19, went into his ninth day in a coma this morning. His backbone is severed because Getz shot him in the back. New Yorkers claim they stand ready to cheer Getz's actions. All right, then, let's go all the way, cheer for gunfire, and make Bernie Getz the mayor. Or when he broke the story of police officers in Queens using electric prods to torture young black men arrested for misdemeanors, including 18-year-old Mark Davidson. Davidson says he turned around and saw the tall man holding something that was black and fit in his hand and had two metal prongs about six inches long. The man then started to apply the prongs to Davidson's body, front and back, and sent shocks through him repeatedly. Davidson yelled. He says no other policeman entered the room to see what was causing the yelling. He was also... Um, um, uh, maybe prescient, I don't know, uh, in his early assessment of one Donald J. Trump. Uh, and if you remember in the uh, 80s and uh, early 90s at least, uh, the press loved Trump because he was, he, was, he was fodder, he was news, he, he you know, drove up circulation. Donald Trump handles these nitwit reporters with a new and most disgraceful form of bribery about which I will tell you. He uses the reporters to create razzle-dazzle. There are five stories in the newspapers and the morning papers leading into 11 minutes of television at night. Trump is larger than life. No, not Trump. Don't use that name. It's Donald. Trump bought reporters from morning papers to nightly news with two minutes of purring over the phone. I just talked to Donald, I heard someone say in the place where I work. Donald called. They even put an article in front of his name as if he were the Bronx. <laughs> And lastly, there's his empathy. Um, Ronnie told me uh, that um, he would become so upset by what he would experience in the streets uh, that he would he would have to take to bed, and he would he wouldn't be in bed depressed for a couple of days. I think he struggled with depression, um, and it could lay him low because I think he felt the pains of the city at times. Um, and his coverage of AIDS uh, helped to win him a Pulitzer. Uh, and I'll just read you one paragraph. This is in 1985. When he looked up in the recovery room, he saw his mother and one of his sisters. A nun came and took them for a cup of coffee. He was in intensive care when a doctor walked in and began poking at his glands. His mother was there the next time the doctor came in. You have Kaposi's sarcoma, the doctor said. There are 10 or 12 more in here. What does that mean, the mother said. He remembers mumbling to his mother, that is the cancer you get when you have AIDS. He and his mother looked at each other. Now the life he never talked about was part of the family album. There are two uh, books included in this collection. And I don't care if you buy it or not. I don't get any money. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, the... the publisher wanted um, how the good guys finally won in the collection. That's, that's his account of Tip O'Neill and Peter Rodino and how they handled the, the, the Watergate investigation. And it holds up. It's quite, quite good. And uh, I think the publishers were right in how, um, how urgent and, and prescient it was and is, right? So uh, there's that. I chose the other one, The Short Sweet Dream of Eduardo Gutierrez, um, which, if you think about it, he wrote that later in his career, and uh, it's just, uh, it's got everything, right? It's got that rage. He's angry at the Giuliani administration. He's angry at the immigration policies of the country. He's angry at the building inspection scams that were going on in the outer boroughs in particular. And here is a young man, uh, uh, undocumented, and he dies as a result of all these forces coming together. There was no swaying or quivering. I, I should explain that uh, Gutierrez died when a building collapsed, right? Okay? So it's a shoddy building. They're doing some construction. The thing collapses. There was no swaying or quivering, no time even for a warning gasp from somebody. An instant, a shrug of concrete and metal, and the floor under Eduardo went. 
Down Eduardo went so quickly, nobody screamed. Down went Alejandro and Lucino and Gustavo and two Angels and Juan. Down they went so quickly that nobody screamed. The third floor fell into the second floor and the second fell into the first and everything fell into the basement. The rear wall blew out as did a wall that was supposed to be tied to the building. There was a cascade of cinder blocks and metal. What were supposed to be metal beams holding up the floors were as strong as aluminum foil. Eduardo fell face first into three feet of concrete on the basement floor and drowned. Then Breslin goes to Mexico and is there for the funeral for Eduardo. He didn't drive. The young women carrying his casket were friends of Eduardo. Their faces were determined. Soon, however, they cried as they made Eduardo's casket dance. Sway forward on the left leg, sway back on the right foot, sway forward, sway back, sway, 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 dance the young man to his grave. That's as good as it gets. So um, that's it. You know, I, I have my own Breslin anecdote, anecdote, but you probably have heard it. Um, I'll tell it if you want. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, I ought to be at the Catskills here. Um, <laughs> Okay, so, so this is what happened. Very, I'll try and do it quickly. Um, uh, I was writing the About New York column, the best job in the world. Um, and then they took it away from me. No, they didn't. They didn't. They didn't, they didn't. Uh, I, was, <laughs> I was writing the About New York column, and uh, I was also dealing with cancer. Not a good cancer. So uh, uh, somehow Breslin heard this. I had never met Breslin, okay? I got a call. When are you going to that place? I said, uh, it took me a moment. When are you going to that place? And he's talking about Memorial Sloan Kettering. And I said, uh, uh, I'm going there Thursday. Um, I have, a, I have a, a procedure. He says, I'll go with you. I said, what? He says, I'll go with you. Meet me at Broadway in 72nd. So on Thursday, I go to Broadway in 72nd. I know what he looks like. He doesn't know what I look like. And I see him. He's bopping along. He had a turtleneck on. And um, I said, uh, uh, Mr. Breslin, I'm Dan Barry. Let's go. <laughs> okay? Let's go to Sloan Kettering. Uh, <laughs> so we're walking east uh, through the park. And he's just telling me stories. He's telling me stories about John Gotti, Emil Griffith, right? Casey Stengel. You know, and then we're halfway through the park. I'm laughing. He's telling me more stories about Trump and Giuliani and, and just the city writ large. And then suddenly I'm in front of Sloan Kettering. And uh, that was it. He distracted me. And I, I said, well, thank you, uh, Jimmy. Thanks. I'll go in with you. When's your wife getting here? And he got pissed off. My wife wasn't there yet, right? <laughs> he actually used a bad word there. And I said, oh, Mary's coming. She'll be right here in a minute. And as soon as Mary came... He never cursed again, okay? <laughs> so I said, Jimmy, uh, Mary, we're going to go in. He goes, I'll go in with you. I'm like, what? So then, then we go into Sloan Kettering, and I had to get into one of those Johnnies, right? That's kind of not a good look when you're meeting, like, a guy you admired for so long. And I come out of my Johnny in those stupid paper slippers, and there's my wife, and there's a nurse, and there's Jimmy Breslin, right? <laughs> And they put, they put us in a little room, a waiting room, and, you know, my ass is exposed, and I'm with Jimmy Breslin, and he's just telling Mary stories, he's telling the nurse stories, and, and they're laughing and everything like that. I'm nervous. I'm also going, like, Jimmy Breslin, what, what's going on here? And, uh, and the joke is they finally bring the gurney in uh, to take me to the procedure, and I made room for Jimmy on the gurney. <laughs> but I remember looking up, and there's Jimmy Breslin. He says, I'll talk to you, and he leaves. Right? So I do the procedure. It's not good. And the next day, I'm feeling sorry for myself. I'm actually quite good at that. I'm feeling sorry for myself. And I think, I, I, shouldn't, I don't have to write my column for, for Saturday. I get a phone call from Breslin. What do you got for tomorrow? <laughs> uh, Jimmy, I thought I'd take the day off, being the procedure and all. Screw that. Screw that. Look at the ground. Look on the concrete. There's stories everywhere. Right. That's what you do. Goodbye. <laughs> I just, I'm, I'm just from the cancer ward, and I'm getting yelled at. And, and, you know, he's right. He was right. He was right. And I wrote a column about walking across the park with someone, and we're all in our own little 
worlds, and we're not aware of everything else. And uh, you know, he used to say, beautiful, right? And that was a beautiful moment for me. OK, questions? I have to say that I just bought your book. I haven't gotten to read it yet, but um, I wish I didn't put together that you were the person speaking or I would have brought it for you to sign it. But I have to say, I miss Jimmy Breslin and Pete Hamill so much all the time. And I'm wondering if there's a particular story that you wish he was still around to cover. <laughs> Aside from everything. I, I, um, you know, he, he would have, uh, there would be no shortage of things to write about. What, what would you, would you love to, to read Breslin on the Adams administration? Like, how many people's phones were seized? Like, that, that's a riff right there. But even more than the Adams administration, I would, I would really love him to revisit Donald Trump. He, w he was hard in his day on Giuliani, you know, uh, uh, what was it, a, s a small man in search of a balcony. Uh, uh, you know, what would he have made of, uh, of uh, the Four Seasons Landscaping Company? You know, there's so many, but uh, particularly what he would do with Trump. That's how I, that's what I think, right? No, the thing is, I was his mascot at the New York Herald Tribune. What does that mean? Well, I'll, I'm going to explain it to you. Sure. Um, he was hired because of... Uh, can anybody here play this game? And it was uh, about the Mets, and uh, John Hay Whitney's sister owned it. Right. So he thought that was very funny, and he came on as a metropolitan uh, co uh, colonist. Right. And uh, he was given a desk in the city room. Now, the city room was about this, twice the size as this room. On one side was a sports, and the other side was a, uh, a, a window over 40th Street uh, with a little separate area for people who had to have private conversations. So he was given a desk right in the middle of the city room. Well, Jimmy did not like being with the hoi polloi. Even, you know, Tom Wolf, Dick Schaap, forget about it. If anybody came over and talked to him or bumped his desk, he would scream and yell to the point he would pick up his typewriter and throw it on the floor. So Jim Bellows, the editor, said to me, he says, deal with it. <laughs> so I said, okay. What was your job in the newsroom? I was the secretary to the editor, Jim Bellows. And... Um, so I got him a desk over in that little quiet place, and he was fine. And then his, his bar bills from Gallagher's was not going to Queens. He was going to Gallagher's. His bar bills from Gallagher's were coming in, and so he'd give them to me, and I'd give them to Stroud. And then other stuff would come in, and I would send it off to Rosemary. They lived in Forest Hills, and she would deal with it. So I became his mascot, and I would go out drinking with him and Fat Thomas and Moochie, and we would hit the bars on the west side. We never went to Queens, no. So, but I would go out drinking with them, and I was just, you know, as I say, his mascot. Um, I, you know, and I still don't know why they picked me to go out drinking with them. I was the only girl. Um, but I was pretty back then. Um, so then <clears throat> the trip died, and... Uh, New York Magazine came. I'm, I'm going to skip over a lot of stuff here. So New York Magazine came. And uh, I was also the first employee at New York Magazine, helping Clay Felker when he was raising the money. And so Jimmy came on as a columnist. Um, and he w was really nice there. I mean, he was quiet. He was not. But what he was doing, you're talking about calling. He was calling me up at 2, 2 a.m. in the morning when the bars were closing, screaming about whatever was going on. And, you know, and, and he also was doing it to Shelley Zelaznik, who was his editor at New York Magazine. And Shelley sat him down and said, no more 2 a.m. calls. So he stopped calling. Thank God. Okay. But then the magazine was not doing well. It, it, was, it, it started in April 1968. It was not doing well. And uh, we could see, kind of see the money kind of going out the door, and there was no more coming in, <clears throat> especially after the, well, okay. So then there was... Um, Are you going to ask a question? No. I'm, I'm, <laughs> no. No. Because I, I, I want to I 
just give you a little bit more, you know, a little... Com- You're writing another Breslin book. This is my op-ed. <laughs> um, so, um, the magazine was not doing well, but then a couple months later, there was this cover line, How to Find an Apartment in New York. Well, the damn thing flew off the newsstands. Clay went click. He, we were covering Lindsay, you know, uh, we were just covering all the political stuff. It was though it was all Adams and, and all that shit, you know, yeah. what have you. So he changed the whole look of the magazine. It was how to, how to live in New York, the best pizza, or, you know, bars up uh, yeah, on the sure. Upper East Side, Red, Dorian's Red Hand, etc. Okay. Jimmy not approve of this. Now he had no he had no skin in this. He was just there as a, but he had no he had it. It was one of the worst things I've ever witnessed in my life. He stood there in the editorial department on the fourth floor of New York magazine and literally had a tantrum. I mean a, a true horrible tantrum. And he not only did that, but he personally vilified Clay. I mean it was re- really one of the most horrible things I've ever witnessed. He st- to be seen again, and, uh, but of course, to her, because he certainly wasn't going to, uh, you know, let it go. Okay, so, tw- <laughs> we, we would like to get on with this lunch, but uh, we're enjoying your stories. Okay, all right, because I have some more. Um, I'm going to leave it to Dan to decide uh, what we, what? All right, I want to tell you about Rosemary. <laughs> I'm not, um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not. I think. I think. Uh, it, it, the last time I saw him. No, How's no. That? Well, sure. Sure. Okay. The last time I saw him was was about uh, ten, fifteen years later. By then, I was at ABC News. Yeah. And I bumped into him in the hallway. He was there to see Dick Wald, and I said, "Hi, Jimmy," and he looked at me like this, and I said, "How are you?" And he never looked at me again. He looked over my shoulder. He looked down at my feet. He looked all over the place. I said, how are you? What are you doing here? Blah, blah, blah. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay, my office is down the, down the office, I mean, down the floor. Come over and see me. Of course, I never heard from him again. But he never looked me in the face once. Hmm. What, is, what is your name? My name, at, in, at, um, at the Herald Tribune, it was Jane Noakes. Now, it is Jane Maxwell. Well, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, no, no, I, I, I knew he commandeered uh, one of the offices of the Herald Tribune, and Walter Kerr and Jean Kerr would be in there, and uh, yeah. That doesn't sound like Jimmy. <laughs> Over here. I want to tell you a different kind of story about breath. We would like a question and not a long story. Just say short story. The t- it was a, it was a day of the jogger who was assaulted in Central Park trial. I went, and the p- others people uh, from Newsday. Others from Newsday did not go who had been covering the trial, including Breslin. And on that day, the jogger itself, herself, unannounced, appeared. As I was leaving, the judge ended the day at noon after the jogger appeared. I met Jimmy Breslin running up the steps. And he somehow knew who I was and he said, is there going to be more this afternoon? And I said, no, that's all for today. There were, however, stories in some New York newspapers by people who were not there that day. But Jimmy wasn't one of them. He didn't write about it. What he said to me is, well, then there's nothing for me to say. And I greatly admired the fact he mm-hmm. missed it and didn't write about it, and he did the right thing. Mm-hmm. And others, including various papers. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Does anybody have a real question? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
Yeah. No, it's right. So I want. I was curious since I did know Breslin through New York Newsday, but your, my question to you is: How do you explain Breslin's attitude towards mobsters? Um, he was very sympathetic. In a weird way. He was. Anyway. Yeah. No. I think he was both both sympathetic and hard at the same time. I, I think that he. First of all, I think. The most important thing is they're great copy, all right? So what he would do is he, he, he gained access to them. In the collection, uh, this is in the early 60s, he went and tracked down uh, the Gallo brothers' grandmother, and she was there in, in a flat on President Street, and you could tell that she was way scarier than any of the Gallo brothers. <laughs> and he does, it, he does it in a way that she maintains her dignity it is funny, scary, and she maintains her dignity. Um, I don't know. I, I think, uh, you know, he, he wrote famously about the two corrupt cops. Uh, I forget their names, Esposito or I, what were those? Ippolito, remember this? Um, uh, but I didn't know that he was terribly sympathetic to them uh, other than to see that they were human beings who could provide him with humor. That's what I think, you know. But you, you might know better, honestly. There's another guy, uh, Michael Resendez. You know, there's a biography coming out by Richie Esposito. I think it'll be out next month or in November. And then there's a Michael Resendez who works at the Boston Globe, worked at the Boston Globe as part of the Spotlight team. I think he was played by Mark Ruffalo. Um, he's doing a, a very serious, where is he? Uh, if he were here, I'd introduce him, but, uh, oh, there he is. You came late. Oh, yeah, no, no, you came late. You came late. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Uh, I'm trying to understand, did you want to do this on your own? Did you approach the publisher? Did they approach you? And what was, was it your personal connection that made you want to do it or just your professional admiration? Um, no, so a book editor approached me and said, uh, you know, if you're interested, I'll approach the Library of America. And, I, and it sounded like a good thing. I'm glad I did it. I'm only kidding about the, the pay. Uh, I thought it was an honor, um, and I thought he was worth it, right? Uh, it took a long time. Um, you know, I hadn't gambled uh, on the, the annotations that were required. So every time he mentioned a forgotten okay. congressman in 1974, I had to look up whatever happened to that congressman. <laughs> but um, no, I, I, I did it, I think, because I thought he deserved it. One more Labor of love, yeah. One more, Dan. Yeah. Um, what was his relationship with booze? Uh, so he did um, know establishments like Gallagher's, but he also definitely knew places like Pet McGuire's. Um, and uh, I think um, he uh, struggled with it uh, for the first 50 years of his life. Um, I think it was, it, was, it was the lubricant he needed to find stories, I think. I think that's where he would hear the stories. Um, I think he went out drinking with Daniel Patrick Moynihan one time. And, you know, I think, you know, he woke up three weeks later or something like that. <laughs> and uh, that put the fear of God in him. And so, uh, and I think when Rosemary died too, I think there was a, a, a life change. And so those of you who know him, he was, he was swimming every morning uh, over the last three or four decades of his life. And he would only have an occasional glass of white wine. He had given it up, you know, in the early 80s, mostly. Uh, but that, that didn't jive with the persona, did it? So anyway. But yeah, he had struggled with it early on, um, and then I think uh, reined it in. This is this is last. <laughs> well, well, Marty. Hi, Dan. You, you get a free one. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Thank you so much for compiling his work into one volume. Now I can get rid of some of my paperbacks. Right. Um, but I'm just curious. Came from the day of the typewriter. Whatever happened to his old machines? Who has his typewriters? Where are they? I honestly don't know. I know that when he was living on West 57th Street. Um, he, was, he was using a computer, but he kept losing the copy. And so at the end of his life, there were all these 
uh, all this um, uh, writing that he did, right, Mike? And uh, and uh, he would not know whether he where he had stored it or whether he had stored it. So maybe Mike knows where the typewriters went. Uh, unfortunately, he was uh, he stored all the typewriters in the basement of one of his sons who lived in uh, Far Rockaway, oh, right. and the basement was inundated with water uh, uh, during Hurricane Sandy, and uh, there were, the, actually the, there was uh, exposed. Uh, Petroleum in the basement actually caught fire. So, all all of there there were some typewriters, there were some notebooks, and apparently uh, they were all uh, destroyed. Yeah. Okay. And Marty, what? Marty, had to... Jimmy left no archives. Jimmy left no archives. So, uh, I was interested in when you first started reading, Jimmy, how it affected your writing, and what you learned about his writing that you maybe underappreciated when you were reading it over three years back to back to back. So uh, I grew up, um, you know, um, on Long Island. Uh, my mother never finished high school. She was an immigrant from Ireland. And my father finished high school at night. And so Jimmy Breslin gave voice to their feelings and how they viewed the world. And so I often joke that in the morning, um, I would come down and my father wouldn't say he loved me. He would just throw the paper at me, say, read Breslin. That's it. That was that was his way of saying I love you, right? Um, and so I, I can't. I don't know uh, uh, whether others can share this, but it, there was something electric about reading him back then. Like you would wake up uh, when he was working for the Daily News. You'd wake up. You come down, and you you. He was saying things that you almost thought weren't permitted to be said or written, and he was saying it with such force and with such rage and and with such humor oftentimes that it was it was uh, just um, uh, it transformed how I looked at writing and we all <laughs> went through a phase where where every third graph was beautiful and we <laughs> we had to eliminate that um, and all, and uh, you know getting into the business myself and going back and reading this stuff uh, what's impressive is um, the economy of language Okay, every damned word is like a, a, a thrown fist, right? And every word has earned its place, right? There are plenty of columns. You know, Frank Kleins once said, if you're hitting 400 as a columnist, you're doing pretty well, like two out of five. Breslin, I think, was hitting well above six most of the time, right? So there's the economy of language. And then the idea that he was writing this on deadline most of the time deadline. So when, when Lenin is assassinated, this is, a, this is true, I think, unless people want to correct me. He was supposedly was in bed at Forest Hills. He gets the call. He goes out there. I think was it one of his sons drove him? It was uh, a kid around the Oh, that's right. It was a family friend. Sir, it's not enough that Jimmy had six kids. He also had, uh, informally adopted a father of this kid around the corner. That's right. Right. And so he, he, he hits, the, he hits the, uh, the apartment building, he hits the precinct, he hits the, hits the hospital, and he goes back to the newsroom, and he writes it, and it's in by 1.30. So he makes deadline. And if you read it, you go, this is pretty polished stuff. And then, of course, when it's in a collection, as you probably know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an editor's note from Breslin, uh, because he wanted a note that, yeah, he knows it's Willis Avenue. He dictated some of it, didn't he, Mike? He dictated because he says that a, co a kid misheard him and used Williams or Willits. Williams instead of Willis. Right. And, right. And, uh, but, so Breslin is both explaining the mistake, but also kind of bragging on himself that he did it. He did all that in under two hours. And if you read it, you go, you know, and he's talking to the cops. And again, it's about Lenin, but it's about something larger in a way, about a, lo about, ab about, um, a loss and memory and all that kind of stuff. On deadline, in an hour and a half, I, could, I couldn't do that. You know? So anyway, hey, thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.